Hey, I'm Andrew Mercado. Welcome to TV Soap. And our very special guest today is someone that has been in hours and hours of Australian TV shows that we love, Eric Thompson. Thanks for doing the show, Eric. Hey, Andrew. Good to see you. So you were born in Scotland and raised in New Zealand. And I've often wondered, because it gives you this sort of mysterious accent, do you (laughs) think that your kind of accent has helped you get work as an actor? Um, I think it's probably a bit of both. I think it's hindered me. I think, you know, on more parochial productions in New Zealand and here in Australia, there are kind of more ocker and kind of really, really very Australian centric um, parochial characters. But um, um, for other roles that it doesn't matter, like I'll, I'll look at a character and go, oh, you know, I'll get a feeling that it's just not the kind of role that I could play and speak like I do. I can do an Australian accent, but I always feel like I'm the accent kind of leads the character. And I, I don't really want to, you know, to be trying to reaching too hard in the black balloon. I did an Aussie accent and I kind of reached a little bit too ochery and, you know, it's just, it's so easy to go into that direction. So um, fortunately uh, on the shows that I've worked on, you know, a couple of them were with, with Joe Porter, you know, who, who did all saints and, and rafters and stuff. She just said, don't worry about it. Just, just speak, use your voice. You know, we like it. It just doesn't matter. So I like that. I can, then I can just concentrate on the, on the role, you know. Before you became an actor, you were actually going to do something quite serious in life. What was that again? There was a point that I might have joined the Navy. I went back to Scotland for a, a gap year and I didn't know what to do. And my dad was in the, he was a, in the a lieutenant commander in the in the Naval Reserve. He was a doctor. Um, and I went into the, the recruitment office in Dundee. And if they'd accepted me, I probably would have done it, you know. But they said, oh, no, even though you're a British citizen, you've got to... Um, You've got to have lived for five years in Britain before you can apply, because I guess I was a security risk coming from New Zealand, which is a very dangerous country. Um, <laughs> but um, fortunately, no, it was it, you know it was the right thing. And then during university, um, I was doing a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature. It's very basic degree, but I was just always drawn to to drama and acting, and I really enjoyed it. And so, it just was a natural progression into it. And um, you know, the other option was be, being a teacher. So, you know, you know, sometimes I, I wish I'd done that, but you know, <laughs> there's still time. There's still time. Was there a particular TV series you used to watch when you were growing up that sort of inspired you to be an actor? Like what made you think, what did you watch that made you think, hey, I think I could do that. I'd like to do that. I never ever really thought I'd be a professional actor because in New Zealand, I thought, you know, that's just not a, a, a thing you know there's there's not enough I mean in retrospect there was actually quite a quite a bit and obviously the only thing now is Shorten Street which is the only sort of ongoing long-running show that you can have a normal kind of life with but growing up was in the, you know for me in this in the sort of late 70s or late 70s was you know the young doctors we used to watch that um again it didn't inspire me to be, become an actor but a lot of stuff <laughs> A lot of the stuff that I watched was Australian, you know. Um, I used to come home for lunch and because uh, we lived quite close to my school and I'd watch the Sullivans um, and I loved the Sullivans, you know. Um, uh, I, um, you know, I was inspired and people like, um, you know, Sam Neill and Bruno Lawrence and Marshall Napier and Andy Anderson, Andy, Andy was on the Sullivans, um, those Kiwi actors that had come across the ditch and worked in all these shows. So when I came to Australia, and I, I, I was meeting, you know, people like Michael Caton and, and, and it wasn't American and British actors that I was a massive fan of. It was Australian actors because there was so much content um, on New Zealand television. And um, um, so I was very excited. And I, you know, I went to my first Logies in 1996 um, and uh, I, saw, I saw everyone. You know, everyone was there, and it was it was like a kid, a kid in the candy store. Sure, store. You did a few TV shows in New Zealand and stuff like that when you started acting. But do you think that maybe you were best known? I ever when I was doing some research on you, it kept coming up that you were in an Auckland Savings Bank ad playing a young dad with Lucy Lawless, who goes on to play Zena, playing your wife. And was that a really big, huge ad? Did people know you for that ad? It, it was the first lesson that I learned is that, you know, the money was great, you know, like it was, I'd been doing theatre and I'd just been living hand to mouth basically for, for, and then suddenly someone says, you know, we're going to pay you 20 grand for doing these four ads. And they were high production vo- uh, volume, but uh, quality, but, um, and with Lucy as well, who, you know, pre-Zena. 
but they were very, very high rotation and they were really cheesy. So they got under people's skins, but I think it actually probably cheapened my, um, you know, that that sort of new face mystery that I think younger actors really need to hold on to if they if they want to, you know, if they've got they've got they've got eyes on being kept serious taken seriously. I think you know being known for an ad campaign before you're known for a feature film or being a theatre actor or whatever it might be. It, it's a double-edged sword. You might get the money, but it, you don't get it, no such thing as, um, you know, something for nothing. But um, but I just worked with Lucy recently. I did an episode of My Life is Murder, and I hadn't really seen her since I, would, I had a recurring role on on, on Xena, and it was just great to catch up with her. Um, and, uh, you know, she's shooting that in Auckland, and, you know, we had a great time reminiscing about the old days. And I, I had all these stories that I told her. She had no recollection of them. They're as clear as a bell to me, but she's obviously been busier. <laughs> that character you played on those shows, so you were Hades in Hercules, then Xena, then young Hercules, and that must have been a great role to play because I remember you always used to talk to me about, you know, the, the thunderbolts that would shoot out of your fingers and all that great stuff they'd add to it in post-production. Yeah, well, funnily, um, you know, Pacific Renaissance, you know, Renaissance pictures of Sam, Sam Raimi and Rob Tappet and then they went to New Zealand, and became Pacific Renaissance, and I think Sam was involved in the first few, but the first few features, uh, sorry, telly movies, and then they made the series Hercules. And in my first, I did, I played another role, and they got me back. That was the thing with New Zealand, with 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 that show. It was kind of B, maybe even C grade TV, but it was culty and it was kind of cheesy, and but it was, um, you could bring actors back and bung on another a wig or some facial hair and they could play something else. I played King Dolan of Tantalus. Um, and then they got me back to play Hades. And in the first episode, I had this big long fight scene with Kevin Sorbo, who was half a God playing, Her you know, Hercules, half a God. And I was Hades. I was a full God. And we had this big fight, you know, and then, you know, the next episode, someone turns up at the door and I just shoot thunderbolt, lightning bolts out of my hands. And I'm like, why didn't I just do that last week? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> why did I have to go through that big fight scene with Kevin Sorbo, you know? Um, but um, yeah. And then, you know, and, and then being a God, he could trans transcend entire productions. So he was Hades in Xena, which I'd nip back to, and I was doing Pacific drive. I'd nip back for the weekend and do a couple of, you know, a couple of scenes, top and tail an episode. Um, and then I had a um, an episode of uh, Young Hercules, which was Ryan Gosling, and, I, and he was probably a fifteen year old kid, and he was he was really um, you know opinionated and 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 quite uh, pre pre precocious, um, and I thought oh, this this kid you know nothing he'll never it, he'll eventuate into into nothing you know yeah. I can really pick them, you know. I can really pick them. Of course, you know now now it's my my classic dinner party. Um, I, I work with him, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so you really can pick them because, you know, your first role in Australia was Pacific Drive. But I wondered if you'd actually been auditioning for any Australian series before you got that role in 1996. I don't know. Maybe. Um, but that was, um, they cast the net quite wide for that. And Maura Faye came across to New Zealand to look for some cast and they wanted some new faces and so she was she and I, I had a meeting with her and funnily enough the next morning I went to my local cafe and I sat down and then Maura Faye and the local cast and directors came in they didn't see me and they sat down and they were sitting at the table behind me and they were just talking about all that I don't think they talked about me but they were talking about all these actors that were friends of mine that I knew and kind of I got this insight into the workings of the casting mind and and uh, yeah, I, I got cast in Pacific Drive when I was in New Zealand, flown to Australia um, and um, was just, you know, mixing with all these young actors doing recalls. And then they offered me a role of, um, you know, Brett Barrett, the gigolo. Which is where you and I met. I was the publicist yeah. for Pacific Drive. And, you know, I look back at all the publicity for Pacific Drive and I found this quote you said about the character you were playing. I think the press kits sort of referred to him as a gigolo. You know, he was on this yacht in the marina there. And, and you said something I thought was really nice. You said, it's a challenge to make him likeable rather than sleazy. People will have a preconceived notion about what a sex worker actually is, but they're just people really. And that's interesting, that phrase sex worker, hearing that in 1996, because, you know, that was, you know, I was trying to think, well, I wonder when we started using that expression rather than just saying 
you know, hooker or prostitute or whatever we used to call them in TV back then. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know why I said it then either, really, because, you know, I guess, well, I, mean, I suppose I've, I've done, done a little bit of research around it, you know, in terms of, you know, gigolos and that kind of scenario, you know, and, and they're perhaps not as high profile as as, as female prostitutes or, or sex workers. Um, and I think there's, there's probably a double standard there, too, that we could we could have a, a core character who is a man, and his his business was deep water pleasure tours, you know, um, but um, have have a man on on Aussie TV as a, as a sex worker, and 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 he and he worked his way up, you know, he married, you know, Kate Raisin's character and became the kind of director of this company, and then she got died, and he be, he became very wealthy, a real success success story, and in the end, you know, he decides that he just wants to sail off into the sunset. When I left a couple of months before everybody else. Um, but yeah, it was um, yeah, it was it was fun and it was it was a, a very exciting time. But the first day that I shot, I was shooting all the kind of character setup stuff. So I had a lot of fifty warders, you know, women coming in from local Gold Coast women coming into my bedroom, you know, the little little tiny bedroom and on the boat. And I think there was about five of them that day. And you know, we wouldn't do anything or, so, but I, there was a lot of innuendo and there was a lot of kind of charming flirtation and all that kind of stuff and i felt i had to i had to shower a lot at the end of that day i felt quite um you know i felt like i'd kind of been through it without having actually gone through it you know i could get an insight into the kind of world that um, i was living so that was probably the best experience in setting me up for the rest of the shoot i remember um once one of those 50 worders who was playing one of your clients it was like was Hazel Phillips and no one was paying her any attention. I'm like, that's Hazel Phillips. She's like the second woman in Australia to win a gold Logie. So I went over there and tried to make yeah. a bit of a fuss of her because, you know, and she was kind of like, oh, do you think they'll write me in as a regular? And I'm like, have a look at the, everyone else in the cast. This is your, you're a 50 worder in this one. Yeah. Well, she was brilliant. And, um, you know, I still remember her, um, you know, she says, oh, we should, I should make you into a perfume. Um, the essence of Brett Barrett, a little dab will do you. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know who she was, you know, like there was quite a few actors, like a lot of the actors I worked with, they'd been on E Street and they were quite a big stars, Melissa Katz and Kate and, you know, uh, Adrian Lee and, and stuff like that. And Simone Buchanan, I kind of knew from um, Hey Dad, but um, I, I didn't really know who was who when I got over here, which was kind of good. It kind of released me from being you know, awestruck by their, their their soap status and a lot of those 90s, 90s soaps and a lot of actors from those 90s soaps kind of have vanished, you know. So, yeah, it's interesting. You used to share this a house with Adrian Lee and you'd have all your scripts pulled up in the corner, you know, hundreds and hundreds of episodes. And that house was called The Bat Cave. It was a place you used to like to escape to, right, a hidden location. Yeah, well, it was only that because the, the, it had an automatic garage door, and we, you know, we could sort of come in and go out like Batman and Robin, you know. But now we, um, yeah, it was uh, in Paradise Waters, and it was it was like a split level, you know, seventies brick house, sort of sixties. It was 60s, probably seventies, and you know, it had a spa pool and a sauna, a bar, a pool room, sunken lounge. It was it was you know it was it was fun, and then it um, then it just became a kind of uh, you know, Scott Michelson came and did it when he was doing Flipper, and there was Richard, someone who's a photographer. And it, as people moved out, people moved in, but usually always men. Um, so it was kind of this bachelor pad kind of thing. And um, yeah, it was, um, yeah, it, we had some fun there, but it was, I was glad to leave in the end. And that house was a couple of uh, houses down from the producer of the show. Yeah, Nick and, uh, We would be doing press sometimes for the show and you know, I'd be there with a journalist and uh, he would say, oh, of all the characters in the show, Brett, that Eric Thompson's character, that's the one I want to be. And it was like, dude, do you have to be so like blatant about this? You know, so- well, we moved in next to him, he kind of rolled his eyes. And then we had Joe Bugner, you know, living next door for a while, Joe Bugner, the boxer. And then on the other side was Nick McMahon. Man. and um yeah it was uh yeah it was a time it was you know that gold coast in the 90s it was it was a certain very, very certain periods probably I, I, I hadn't been back since i left um uh pacific drive i hadn't been back to the gold coast since 1997 and then last year uh, i went i was back twice once for the logies and once for the gold coast film festival with the film how to please a woman it was the opening night film so um 
yeah, it went down a treat again. Gigolos. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it was. it's interesting making shows on the Gold Coast as opposed to maybe your first, if you'd gone to Sydney or Melbourne, it's a very different dynamic because there people make the show and then they go home to their families and everything afterwards. Whereas up on, on the Gold Coast, everyone was kind of away from home. And yeah. so there was a much stronger cast and crew connection. I mean, gosh, it felt like there was a party on every single weekend that we were always hanging about at. Not even every, every weekend, you know, like every day of the weeks, you know, towards the end, it would seem like someone would, oh, what are we going for a drink tonight? It's like we've got to work tomorrow. Um, but um, it didn't seem to matter. Um, we were young then, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was to begin with, we, everyone stuck together. I think there was 12 of us in, this, in the core cast, can't remember, but we all stuck together. And if one person was doing it or two people, everyone would do it. And then just after a few months, p- people sort of factioned off and, you know, the, the, um, the, the shine came off the ball a little bit as we realized that we were there for the long haul. And, and, um, you know, it was, it was, it was good, you know, it was, it, but because Channel Nine for the whole second year, or even that might have been the first year, they didn't have it on air, so you were shooting a show that was still being exported, um, but you weren't getting any feedback. You didn't have any local audience. There was no publicity. There was it was hard to get publicity. There were, we were kind of like a, you know, it's like kind of doing a play in a, an auditorium full of one person. You know, like it's just that you need, even though there's television you need to have that kind of energy coming back, just knowing that people somewhere are appreciating you. And we did get that. Um, we got it. We had a pretty solid culty audience, you know, um, in the hospitality community and the gay community uh, seemed to be, we, we were kind of culty. It seemed, and that, that was, that was cool in the end, I think. What you said is exactly true. So if they aired the show the way that it was made, you know, five nights a week soap, it would have, it, we made 18 months of episodes, right? But it took Channel 9 from episode one to the last one, five years to screen it, stopping and starting, even to the point that they screened the last episode. And I got in touch with them and said, that's not the last episode. There's one more. And there's like, no, there's not. And it took them another year to figure out that they had cut the first three episodes into two episodes for the premiere. And then that had put their numbering out for the whole series. So then they screened this last half hour episode, which by the way, the the entire show ended around your character. The very last shot in the show is Amber played by Christine Stephen Daly, deciding that she's going to leave Pacific Drive and go off in search of you because she's in love with Brett. And so they hired a helicopter and did this incredible aerial shot pulling back to show where it was. And that's what I was saying to Channel 9. It's like there's this incredible last shot in it. You've got to find this last episode. But- I've never seen it. Never seen it. And I and I and even my character sailed off in his boat and they did that afterwards. So I never saw my my last episode either. And they, you know, because they back then they would buy the repeats. So they would do because they started to play it during the day as well. And then I think they did it again. So I think they you've got three repeats. And so now if they wanted to show it again, it would be they'd have to pay us all, which they would they would never want to do. So um it's done, I think. You went from Pacific Drive, though, into All Saints, and you mentioned someone before, Joe Porter. Joe Porter, one of the you know producers on Pacific Drive, ended up being a very important person in your life because then you and her, she took you on this journey through then two hugely successful shows after Pacific Drive. Yeah, well, I, I had a good relationship with Joe on 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 Pacific Drive. She was the associate producer, and we you know we we got on well, and she was kind of there, and in many ways she was the glue. You know, Bruce Bass was the producer, and he was busy and stuff, and you know, um, she was kind of the glue that kind of held the whole thing together. And um, yeah, then she got you know headhunted by Bevan Lee and John Holmes went to set up um, All Saints. They asked me if I was interested in year one, but I, I wasn't. Um, and then year two, they came back to me and the character kind of spoke to me and I, I did put a tape down and came back over and had a had a test. Yeah, so I worked with Joe for quite a few episodes on that and she she went off and did um, All Was Greener and my wife, Caitlin, did that. And then, um, um, uh, and then Rafters, you know, so mm-hmm. we've, and then now she, and then she's just ca- continued to kick on, you know, she's a, she's a great person and she's, yeah, it's, it's we're, we're the very sick, much the same similar age as same as you and I I think we're kind of all of that that vintage and um 
we've all come from the same kind of genesis, you know, so it's, it's nice to see us all still around and in various capacities mm. of the industry. Yeah. You won two Logies, were voted most popular actor uh, for playing Dr. Mitch Stevens in All Saints. And that was a hugely, hugely popular character, as opposed to Pacific Drive, where you said you were playing to like a de- an auditorium with no people in it. What was it like going into this much bigger show on TV and then that the immediate audience reaction that you must have got? Yeah, well, it, it was in the days of of network television ruling the ruling the airwaves. Basically, it was the only place you could watch it, and it was appointment television. You know, if you wanted to watch All Saints, you couldn't stream it whenever you wanted to. You had to be sitting in front of the TV at seven thirty, eight thirty on a Tuesday night. So, similarly with Rafters, you know, it was that that you know. So the power of um, free to air television. And I was telling something the other day. Actually, I started episode forty four or something like that of of All Saints. Um, and it was the beginning of 1999, I think. And Kerry Stokes, who was running the network at the time, got us all for luncheon, a luncheon. And they'd already been on air for 43 episodes the previous year, or 42, whatever, the previous year. And he came in, and they were still number two in the time slot because Channel 9 had put Water Rats up against it. So you had these two competing Aussie dramas were competing, and 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 Water Rats was winning, and um, All Saints was pulling 1.1, 1.2, which back then million which was wasn't enough to really justify your existence um but he said look if we're not number one in the time slot by the end of this year he didn't say as much as i'll ask you but the intimation was that um that'll be it but the fact that reflecting now that the the head of the network was prepared to give us a whole other year to bet in our audience and we did knock up knock water rats off the, the the number one slot and i was at the christmas party when the producer of all saints of uh, sorry of of water rats had just been told by channel nine that it had been axed and Anne Fay had said to him why did they ax you and he points at me and he says because of these guys you know <laughs> and it was their decision to put them against up up against us in the first place so you know it's it's um you know, I think that's a, that was a terrible thing when Aussie TV shows did that. But um, yeah, and then all sense just went off and up and up and up. And we had the, um, you know, we had the the Olympics and coming back. I think we we cracked the the two million viewers straight after the Olympics, number one of all TV shows in the week. And that week they cut our budget. I was told by ten or fifteen percent because again they go, oh, we're up there now. So suddenly, as opposed to having Twining's tea in the green room, we were having just gumboot tea in the green room and you know the, all these little cuts started to come in and and when we started to slip in the ratings they top a bit pour a bit more cash in and do a um like eric banner was the bomber in um the beginning of uh series three i think he blew up the hospital and um, the, the, the crazed bomber just he just shot chopper was mates with kevin carlin chopper hadn't come out so he could qu- quickly go and do a little guesty on all saints and blow the place up and yeah so it's um it was amazing, yeah. It was amazing the the impact that show had, and it really it really holds up the quality of the show and the writing. And those days where the directors would get a chance to work all the time, the writers work all the time perfecting their craft, shooting an episode of television in four days, um, and everyone was at the top of their game. And these days, a series of television is six episodes, and it's got to it's got to land correctly, or it doesn't get any more than six. It's just um, the skills are getting dissipated because we don't have those long running series other than of course neighbors and home and away but not those hourly weeklies yeah i i can remember a time sometimes in the 80s where channel 7 channel 9 and channel 10 all three of them would have australian dramas up against each other and you're like well someone's going to lose badly in that equation but yeah you're right we had hours and hours of tv there and i don't know what happened with all Saints, maybe during COVID when people were in lockdown, and I know it was streaming on 7 Plus, but it still appears to be incredibly popular. And I just saw last night, they're about to release a giant box set of every episode of All Saints. So clearly, um, there's a market and the, the popularity of that show endures to this day. Well, wow. Well, it'll be, if it's the entire show. The set. entire thing. Yeah, the, the the real surprise is that it's still very successful in Iran um, because uh, I've got a lot of Iranian Instagram followers and they they could obviously take it because it was fairly tame from a, you know, from a, a Muslim point of view, there was there was not a lot of, you know, and they'd obviously cut stuff out. But um, I have 
they will run the whole thing and then go, go back to the start. So every generation will see All Saints because they bought it. And it's it's called, I was in Dubai in the spice markets um, when I was doing getaway and this, uh, I was buying some saffron and this Iranian Persian man went, um, doctor. And I went, um, no, no. He goes, doctor, t- TV. I went, oh, yeah, I'm an actor. And then he goes, oh, no, no, no. And then he calls out all his mates and all these other spice sellers come running out of the shop and they're all surrounding me. And I'm like, whoa, you know, I don't, I don't thought it'd be quite fun to go to, to go to Iran and, and, uh, do a, do a convention or something. <laughs> When you left All Saints, it was like this long death sequence. I'm wondering how long they planned that out. Did you say to them, look, I want to go in six months' time or you weren't going to sign a new contract and they write that sort of long goodbye? Yeah, well, I didn't want to drop the minute, but I, I came back to work after the Christmas holidays and I think I had a big long day in, in, in the nurse's station where everyone was there and I just sat there and I just went, I can't do this anymore. I, I I really don't want to come back after next summer and do it again. You know, it was it was just I done like I said, 175 episodes. I've done everything. I've been married, divorced, you know. Uh, but you know, all that um so many, so many storylines. And I just didn't really know. And so I told them at the beginning of the year, I said, look, I'm just giving you a year's notice, you know. So they kind of planned it and and I think at some point, um this Di Drew, whoever was producing at the time, said, "You know, we're going to have to kill you off because the character is too popular. You know, so popular. We don't want. We don't. We need to build it up and really u- utilize it as a springboard to something else." But she said it in a way that was from. I, I took it as anyway, as a kind of like, "This is going to be a final decision. You know, if if you're going to do it, you've really got to be committed to it." And I said, "Yeah, I am." And of course, I, I was worried. You know, I was worried about it, but um. In retrospect, I think it was the right thing to do. After uh, Now, in 2004, you made The Alice, set in Alice Springs, with your wife, Caitlin McDougall. It was a telly movie that then became a series. Posey thought it would be a good idea to put us together on on, on The Alice. Right. I think we'd, 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 think we'd had, that, had the chemistry, you know, and we were really hoping that we did. Uh, you know, because it would have been a bit embarrassing if we didn't, if our characters didn't have the the chemistry. Now she did all, all was greener before that. Yeah, it was very different. I mean, he was Jack Chaffers was a rock star, you know, like a faded rock star, and and um, I guess it's that thing that people keep you know keep in mind. A lesson that I learned is that you know, you as an actor aren't necessarily popular. The character that you play is popular. And Mitch was a very popular character. So changing tack and doing something like Jack, which was very different than Mitch, as much as the show was good, and I think in some ways it was ahead of its t- ahead of its time. The telly movie rated really well. Um, then they took a year for it to come on air, and um, it just it, yeah, it just failed. To, it was just timing. They they didn't have episodes backed up, so we, we could go straight into production. Our r- original producer left. And so we got John Edwards came on board and it was all part of Southern Star. And it it just, it, it, it and the head of drama changed. Um, I think, no, 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 Posey was still there, but there were issues around it. It was sort of didn't have a, didn't have a parent and um, parents that cared really. And so, and, oh yeah, no, that's right. David um, Gingell left and Sam Chisholm came on board and Gingell liked it. And Chisholm, it just it was all about numbers. Um, and, you know, he axed it. Um, we were shoot, still shooting and he pulled it off air. And I was doing this scene in the sweat lodge, which was a tent with like a fire in it, with water on it. And I was just, all I was wearing were wife fronts and blundies. And I got the phone call from the producer to say, and, I, and she said, well, I'm not sure whether we should tell the crew. I said, we've got to tell the crew. And I just, I said, I'll tell them. And I just walked out and I had a standing there in my undies with an umbrella and blundies and just said, guys, I've got some bad news. We've got four days more of this and then it's, it's over. We just heard from the network and everyone's was sort of moping, but we had the best four days, you know, like it was just, just the the best way to end, you know, and I really really loved that show. And like I said, it was it was in the old mold of twenty two hours. Mm. I think had it been a eight episode or ten episode, had we had more time, I think the spirit of it was right, but the the model was wrong, and it was in that era where things were just starting to change. 
I found this quote when you were making Pacific Drive about your ideal woman, and you said she'd be a cross between Benazir Bhutto, Audrey Hepburn, and Greta Scacchi. So I'm guessing that's Caitlin now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I suppose at the time, de- definitely. But yeah, maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it, I don't know. But certainly, I th- that's a quite a good hybrid. But get those three together. Hmm. I also got a chance to work with Greta like last year. I was out. Uh, Peter Amenta offered me a job on a on the thing she did with Brian Brown. Uh, um, Darby and Joan. Darby, Darby and Joan. Yeah. yeah. I was very excited, but it didn't work out. I couldn't. Uh, I think. I think it was still COVID. There was access issues. To, to Queensland or something. Anyway, um, that would have been good. But yeah, I was a bit of a fan of, um, she did a show, Greta did a show in England with um, Toya Wilcox and an old, um, it was a mini series and basically it was set in the south of England and with Toya Wilcox and a young Greta Skarki and, and this, this this old man who had them running around kind of in very little clothing. Um, uh, at a very influential time in my life, I fell in love with her and it would be lovely to <laughs> meet her one day. After the Alice, you ended up back at Channel 7 and then Pack to the Rafters. If we talk about ratings and maybe maybe Pack to the Rafters was the last big Australian drama that kind of hit the ground running and was like 2 million plus. Literally, it feels like from the first episode, it was a huge hit from night one, wasn't it? Yeah, well... It had, a, had the lead in of the Beijing Olympics. Rebecca Gibney was in it. Michael Caton, I guess myself to a certain extent. Brand new cast, great cast, NIDA, new NIDA graduates. Um, Joe Porter was there. It was a Bevan Lee show. It was promoted, you know, beautifully by Channel 7. They had, they had all the eyeballs of the Beijing Olympics. The time zones were kind of like right. And and so, yeah, we launched um, Tuesday night, at Tuesday night, 8.30, 1.9 million the next morning, we're having a read through for the for the for the next block because we were shooting the series still when the show went to air, and Joe Porter was at the end of the table, and the ratings came through, and 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 usually the second episode dips, you know the old J curve, it'll dip for a little while and it'll build the audience again. We went to two point one million that that second episode, um, and I still remember that thing of that's. That's unheard of, and we never and we we hung around that two million a week. We were the highest rating show on TV, above sports, above news, above everything, and it was it was quite a thing. It really just captured the zeitgeist, and it was, it was exactly the kind of show that people wanted at exactly the right time. Did you ever have any concerns about playing a dad? Because packed to the rafters, you had like these three grown up kids. And, you know, sometimes you hear that some actors are like, oh, I don't want to play the dad role. Yeah, I want to, you know, I'm still the the, the sexy single. But you went straight into there as Dave Rafter, the electrician with these, yeah. these three grown kids. Yeah, and I was only 40, you know, like, and I had, and Jess and Hugh, and I mean, they were in their 23, you know, so I, w- I was probably a bit young. I was playing up a little bit and, you know, um, uh, Rebecca's three years older than me, so which I reminded her about quite a, quite often, uh, or maybe two. Uh, well, let's just say three. Um, initially, I actually, when they offered me the job uh, or the, the the chance to get the job, um, I didn't want to go back into it because it, it wasn't so long since I'd done the Alice. I'd been stung on that. I'd done Getaway after that, which was a, a strange move, but it was you know some fun. Met some cool people, did some cool things. But going back into the option thing with a drama series where you're kind of, you've got to sign a three-year option. You've got to sit around waiting for whether the show is going to get renewed and you can't do any other stuff. I wasn't really up for it. But then my agent who, um, you know, who represented Rebecca as well, they said, oh, well, Rebecca's going to do it. They want to get you to get together for a chemistry test to sit in front of the camera and have, do a scene. And, you know, I kind of went, I, I never really thought about the dad thing. You know, I never really go, I, I, you know, but I, I, I just went along with it, and we got on really well. And um, funnily enough, you know, with rafters, um, we never had to wait to see whether we were going to get picked up. We always knew we were going to get picked up. As much as you know, when the letter would would be sent to the agent um, from the network to say that the, 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 the they'd ring, you know, they'd ring you and tell you, and you'd be like, oh, whatever. You know, it's like it's, it's obvious they're not going to they're not going to kill the golden goose, and. Um, and in the end, it was Rebecca and I who kind of said to the network because it was becoming kind of generic. It was becoming, you know, the kids had all left and we were getting 
kind of ring-ins and cousins and long lost brothers and all that kind of stuff. And again, we'd done it, we'd done it and it was such a massive success. We kind of felt we really should just preserve that. Um, and um, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, the problem was that title. I mean, the title was clever, packed to the rafters, but that title suggested that your little suburban house always had to be packed with all these relatives because yeah. that's what the show was called. Yeah, and then when we did the when we did the the uh, re- revival of it, back to the rafters, which was in twenty twenty. As much as I think it was quite a good show, and it was good to catch up with the characters, we lost that because the family was uh, was split apart. And I think it just um, that whole, you know, boomerang family, the, the children that go and they always come back, go and they always come back. And this one, we didn't have that. It was we, we were all separate and and Dave and Julie were going to maybe get a divorce, you know. So it was kind of it it, it 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 just proved uh, as much as I, I really admired um, Amazon for giving it a go and Seven for giving it a go that um, it just proved that, you know, some things are best left alone. Um, you know, some things are of a time in the shooting model of rafters, you know, we, the, the 60% studio, 40% location, um, it had very, very, uh, you know, very, very specific limitations around it. And the writers could write into that, those limitations, adding more money would never help because suddenly it would become something else. So we, on back to the rafters, we were shooting hundred percent on location. There was no studios stuff. Um, so it was just a different show. So you know the same people, generally speaking. But um, it just um, rafters was a was a it was just a, it was chemistry magic. It all happened. It all came together. Great people of the right time. It yeah. seems crazy. Like you you had such success with all those shows. And you really, you've had such a great run, but then you actually got another great show in there, 800 Words, which I, I'm assuming was a special show for you because it took you back to New Zealand. But also you stepped up and you became an associate producer of 800 Words. So tell us how that show happened. Well, before I came to um, Australia, I used to, I worked for a company in New Zealand called South Pacific Pictures. And um, I, um, John Barnett, who was the head of it, for a long time we'd bump into each other he was always over here trying to get new zealand shows or doing co-productions and stuff but there was always this sense that um a kiwi show would never fly which by the way i find really really offensive that notion here in australia because if you look at just the output of south pacific pictures alone outrageous fortune one of the greatest dramas made in the southern hemisphere shortland street's still a great show and it's horrific that here in australia we just poo poo it and go oh they're just kiwi dramas yeah well exactly and and i i kind of when when Tim Baum, who was the head of development at SPP, is an old friend of mine from Tauranga, New Zealand. We kind of grew up together, used to play in a band together. Anyway, he sent me this um, this two pager called Eight Hundred Words about the writer, newly widowed, two kids. And I said, and they said, well, and I, I spoke to them. I said, well, you know, put together a buzz a buzz reel. I'll do the voiceover for it. We'll take it to Channel Seven. I was on contract with Seven. Seven looked at it and they went, Ah, oh, we want to do it, but we don't want to do it in New Zealand. And I said, well, it'll, then it'll just be sea change because it would have the same premise. But although she was divorced, she wasn't widowed. Um, sea change had only occurred a few years before. And so it was very similar, but we haven't jumped the, the ditch. Um, and we made a pilot for something else, um, which was very similar to Dr. Doctor, actually, um, that wasn't picked up by the network because they decided that they wanted to, to make 800 words. And I thought they'd just come to their senses. As it turned out, there'd been a new incentive introduced by the New Zealand government for, you know, 40% rebate on foreign investment. So they were going to get 40. It was going to be cheaper. But also it had a quality. Uh, James Griffin, who wrote Outrageous Fortune, was the was the head writer. I knew that it was going to be good. We got a great cast. The premise was great. Um, so I kind of was the matchmaker between <laughs> SPP and, and as no. well as the lead actor. And it was great to get it up. And... When it went to air, we in Australia, some of the cast came across, and we just had we we, we watched in a pub at the Rock down the rocks, and I was staying nearby, and um, we just had a few beers and watched it, and you know it was it was great. And the next morning, I went in, and Brad Lyons was there, and they were all like, 
you know, it was 1.2 million at one the night, you know, it was, it was just this big success, you know, great ratings, great reviews leading up to it. And, and the promos were fantastic. And Kerry Stokes was in town and he invited me up to his office and I hadn't really met him one-on-one and we sat there and he said, going back to the New Zealand thing, he said, when they told me, uh, they were making this show in New Zealand, I said, what the F are we doing that for? Nothing we've done over there has ever worked because they'd done some reality stuff. And he then he then he said, "But Eric, I love being proved wrong," and um, and we we succeeded on a couple of different areas. One was getting Kiwi voices and it's making people realize it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if the show's good. You know, we're, people are going to watch it if it if it appeals to their their sense of aspiration or it takes them outside and whatever values they see there, they're going to watch it. If they like the characters, they're going to watch it. But also things, this is in 2015, and it's, it, it's the, it was the beginning of the Netflix generation. It was the kind of end of the, the free-to-air generation, and our ratings declined, not because the show declined in popularity. It was because the competition was there, ad-free dramas, Netflix, and then you know everybody else that got on board. But you know we, we managed to cast uh, Indigenous New Zealand Māori, you know, Māori cast. Half, quite a few of the cast members were Māori. We are... Our central cat, one of our central characters, played by Melina Vidler. She, she got on, you know, had a uh, uh, intercultural relationship with a, the Maori actor, and it became just normalised. And, and it, now, in twenty twenty three, we're used to that. But then, mm-hmm. especially on the commercial networks, it wasn't kind of done. So I was really proud that we'd managed to kind of smash down a few of the old school thinking. That, that ran Australian TV, that very white, very conservative, very Aussie sports news um, reality kind of stuff and succeeded. You know, that was a re- I was really proud of that. Yeah, it was a great show. And I think you're right. I think New Zealand has 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 been ahead of the curve there. It's like I remember last year asking South Pacific Pictures if they could give me a breakdown of the cast of Shortland Street, which is their five nights a week soap, in terms of Maori cast. And they said it's 50% regular and guest actors, 50% every week. And you just go, wow. I mean, you, could, you, you we would still struggle to match that anywhere on an Australian production. I, I can't think of an Australian production that's got a 50% Indigenous cast rate every week of the year, like you know, eight hundred words, and and all your your Kiwi productions. Yeah, well, I mean, with with Shortland Street, they don't. I don't. I don't. I mean, I'm not a hundred percent sure on this, but I'm pretty sure that when they say um, we've got a new doctor, he's twenty eight. It's a it's, he's male, for example. That's all they say. They don't say of Pacific Island descent, of Maori descent, of anything, or Indian, Asian, whatever. They just go, we want it. And and it's people come in and test for it, mm. all different cultures, and they cast the best person. And they get this beautiful multicultural, um, you know, television show. Um, here, it's still quite, you know, you've got to, it's got to be thought through a little bit more as opposed to let's just cast it and then we'll just make it up from there we'll get the person that embodies the essence of the character regardless of its cultural background and then we'll then we'll surround it with whatever that cat that actor brings to the character um so new zealand are there they've been there for a long time and and hopefully we'll get there in australia i think we will eventually but it's just a, a bigger country the wheels move slower but you know we'll catch up with new zealand eventually you've played so many uh characters that are like leading men, romantic leads, you know, iconic dads here on Australian TV. But lately you've been taking a slightly more crazy diversion into characters. We think of that great sitcom you did on the ABC after Taste where you played Chef Wallace and then to see you playing a colonel in court on stand, which is just so hilarious, one of my favourite shows this year. Um, and is that the stage of career you're at now that you're being offered crazier things or are you wanting to put yourself in on that new direction? It's a bit of both, really. I mean, after after Taste, um, I was a producer of, and I kind of got behind the writer. She sent me directly, sent me the the thing. It was then called Yes Chef, and it was it was much more um, outrageous. Um, but it just you know, as we developed it more, we re, you know the closer productions in Adelaide repitched it. Um, but it was kind of more of the time. I think 
you know, being a white middle class, middle aged man, um, very few. Whenever you look, read the Screen Australia or whatever New Screen New South Wales, uh, it's it's always female leads now. Uh, they're different cultures, which is great. Um, funnily enough, so the only way I could be, you know, a leading man was being an asshole. <laughs> you know, white middle aged middle class man who had been cancelled because he was a, he was a bastard. You know, and it was kind of that's just what it kind of became. It was perfect timing. So, you know, our, the the character that everyone was championing for was Diana, the, the young niece, the female young niece who, you know, kind of was, was schooling him in the fact that the culture was different. So it was, it, it came at the right time. Um, and also I, I guess I did want to smash up that nice guy kind of, that's all Eric can do. He can just do that. And, you know, I, I I had a lot of pent up anger for so I from over the years of having to bite my tongue. So it was good, a good way to get rid of a bit. Um, and then things like um, you know I had a little role in Black Snow, a little little role in you know in in Court, and um, you know Sam Neill was going to play the role in Court, but Sam got sick, and because they were going to get Sam and Brian together, and then you know more of sorry Anne Faye and and. Um, um, the people at, at, at Fair Casting and and Kit Gurry, who's an old mate, you know, he's they just went, oh, who who should we get to replace him? And I thought, well, big fill, shoots shoes to fill, but I just seized it with both hands, and it was a great opportunity. Um, so you know, I'm enjoying that. Um, get, yeah, getting given um, just chances to spread my wings a little bit. You know, the, it's not as the, the consistency of work. You've, you're not number one on the call sheet. You're not there every day, but I've done that. And that comes with pressure, huge hours. You know, it's, um, I've, I've kind of done it and I'd like to do it again, but um, it's just a case of seeing what, you know, which way the, which direction the wind blows really, because it's, we're, we're in a state of flux with everything, you know, with, with quotas, with streaming services, with, um, yeah, how people watch TV has changed so much in, in, in the 30-odd years I've been in this business. Has it ever? And, you know, 30-odd years, that means 30-odd years probably. It's going to be 30 years, that Pacific Drive. And when you said we were young back then, I was going through some photos the other night and I found some photos and it was like, whoa, we really were young. You look at those photos and go, and I, <laughs> I, look, I look back on that job up on the Gold Coast and I think it probably was the most fun I ever had in a workplace. I know it wasn't the greatest show in the world and, you know, but man, we had the best time up there and, you know, made lifelong friends and, you know, I think a great entry point for you into the Australian TV market, if nothing else. Yeah. Well, we, you know, I met a lot of directors. We had a lot of great guest actors would come up to Sydney. They'd be like, they'd come up to the Gold Coast from Sydney or Melbourne and they'd be like four weeks on the Gold Coast. They'd be like, brilliant. You know, you'd, you'd get these great actors, directors, people that I can, that I build up relationships with and, and continue to see throughout the, you know, throughout my career. Thank you so much for chatting to us today. It's great. I can't wait to see what you pop up in next. Thanks, Andrew. Take it easy. Great to see you.